Hello, welcome back to another world building video. Today I'm doing one on nature, how it relates to humans and other species within your fantasy world. If you haven't already watched the one on fantasy terrain that I've done, go back and watch that one now because obviously nature is intrinsically linked to everything else within your terrain. Let's start with some basic examples of ecosystems that relate to what you could have in your fantasy world that we'll take from our world. So if you think about some of the hot climates in our world, some of the really desert-like countries, then you think about what kind of animals that they have there. In terms of transport, you can't have anything that's going to be really heavy and really slow. It requires tons and tons of water. So you're more likely to have something like a camel that's very good at carrying heavy loads. It's very good in warm climates. It can retain lots of water. You wouldn't have something that was covered in too much fur. But equally, of course, deserts get very cold at night. So a camel is kind of the ideal sort of creature. You think about snakes, you think about insects, you think about the kind of nature that would grow within a desert. You don't get enormous forests, but what you do get are small oases. There's water deep under the surface, of course, animals gather and come there to drink. You get trees and plants and other things cropping up that require water. Humans and other species, of course, within your fantasy world would go towards that area as well. Maybe there are a number of oases between the cities or towns within your world. Maybe there's a town set at one of the oases. So just little things you could think of and build your society and nature connected to it. Another example, this one of course I'm taking from Star Wars, just because when I'm talking about different territories and climates and nature, it doesn't have to be just one part of your world, it could be the entire world. So in Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, of course there's the planet Hoth, which is an ice planet. And there aren't many creatures on that that we've seen. There's the monster that lives in the cave that Luke fights, and of course for getting around, they say eventually it gets so cold on some parts of the planet that even technology, the speeders and other things break down, so they can't go too far in. And then you think about what do they use to get around on the surface of the ice, and they of course have tauntauns, these sort of two-legged um, creatures that they can ride, but eventually they get so cold even for them. But they did some very clever world building there with the nature, because if you look at tauntauns, they have a very heavy layer of fat and they're quite good and agile for moving around on the snow. So they kind of thought about the climate, thought about the area and said, right, what would we have? What kind of creature would we have on there that's good for moving around? And that worked really, really well. So if you're having some kind of really frozen part of your world, or maybe the whole area has a very low temperature, something like that for transport would be a really good idea. If we look at another example within our worlds and you think about the Florida Everglades, you think about the kind of animals that you get there, with crocodiles and alligators, water snakes, lots of insects, reed beds everywhere. Think about transport, boats is probably the obvious answer. But if this is set within a fantasy world, why does it have to be something obvious? Why couldn't it be something that you've made up, something completely fantastical? I think sometimes when people start world building, they think very much on our world and then just slightly off to one side, but it doesn't have to be. What if there's some kind of aquatic animal that's really good, that's really strong, really powerful, that we've learned within this world how to control, how to breed, how to care for, and therefore they're the best thing for transport? Why not? Why not? Bring something different to the world. As you know, the fantasy market, like everything else, is very, very crowded. There's lots of books being published every year. So if you can bring something different to your fantasy world that people have never seen before, that makes it unique, why wouldn't you? So why do what everyone else has done? The next thing to, to do with nature is think about impact. In our world, we've had a knock-on effect on various types of wildlife, whether it's through destroying their natural habitat with logging or other things, or just that as humanity and we've spread out into our towns and cities, they've kind of been forced to come in and search for food. So where I live in the UK, we see foxes quite often running around at night through the streets searching for food or just hunting or running around because we've kind of encroached upon their natural territory. You think about in Canada, there's videos all over the internet of bears coming down and going through dumpsters for food because they can get a lot more food that's kind of high in fat from dumpster than they could it's the same amount of time. It would take them hours and hours of grazing berries and so on for hibernation. And this happens all over the world with different kinds of wildlife. The next thing to think about with nature is, of course, hunting. 
In our world, various animals are hunted. Other people believe that certain internal organs of certain animals grant them healing abilities and have special effects upon your health, mental well-being and other things. You could have something similar within your world. Equally, it could be related to herbs. What if there's something that's very particular and very rare and very powerful herb or plant that gives people some kind of abilities or they just need it every day or it could be a very powerful drug whatever it might be but you can bring something interesting and different to your world i keep saying it because it's so important we want to see something unique another thing to think about is the knock-on effect of nature there's something in nature called a trophic cascade if you've never seen the video online there's one that's called i think it's how wolves change the course of rivers and this is focused on yellowstone national park now until fairly recently there weren't any wolves, they've kind of been wiped out of that area. And the impact taking out the apex predator was actually quite disastrous. So a few years ago, they reintroduced two wolf packs into Yellowstone National Park, and it has had a positive effect. So before this, the riverbanks were being eroded, there was lots of deer, they were grazing down, they were taking lots of all the plants and all the herbs and everything else, and the grasses, They'd come out quite easily and graze around because their numbers were out of control. When they reintroduced the wolves, there was this kind of cascade effect, as you might expect. The deer population was reduced, but also they learned how to graze more carefully. They didn't come out into open spaces because of the risk. They suddenly had fear of a predator, which is part of nature. What it meant is they wouldn't go down to the rivers as often, and the riverbanks were able to be more reinforced with plants and grasses and other kind of plants that would grow there that were being dropped by birds and other things which meant the riverbanks were a bit more secure which meant there was more insects and wildlife which meant there's more birds that were attracted to feed on them and this had this kind of ripple effect that gradually it brought in bigger species and small mammals and other things and it went on and on and on to the fact that the rivers are much stronger, the banks are much stronger, the population of deer is much better. Uh, I'll put a link to the video down below, but it's fascinating just to kind of see that if you take out the top apex predator of this kind of pyramid within what is a natural system, it changes everything else within the system. And it's really something that I'm gonna bring more into my fantasy. With all of that being said, I'm not suggesting that you go out and build an entire ecosystem from the insects all the way up to the top mammals. But it's something that you should at least think about. Think about the terrain and then think about what kind of nature would live within that area. Start with the ordinary kind of things and then bring something extra, add something special, an X factor that we haven't seen before. And just make the world feel lived in. If you have an enormous world bible with all this information in and you love creating it, brilliant. You probably won't use most of it unless you have someone traveling through a region and they encounter various wildlife. But if you've got some of that information in your back pocket, it's good to bring out and add into the story. And of course, the impact on nature affects humans, not just in terms of what they can eat, but also what kind of clothes they wear. If people are making a lot of leather and they wear a lot of leather armor, then of course that has to have come from animals. What kind of animals are they hunting and skinning and tanning the hides? That means there's an industry for people to produce leather. That means a skilled craftsman to make the armor. And it just adds on a ripple effect like I've spoken about before. As I mentioned a couple of times, I think if possible, you can bring something extra to your world and maybe something exotic. I'll give you a couple of examples. One is from Anthony Ryan's series called uh, Draconis Memoria Trilogy. And this isn't a spoiler, this is part of the basic setup of the world, so don't worry, I'm not spoiling anything in the story. He has dragons within his world, the dragons on the front cover. But it relates to what I've been saying, because within his world, there are different species of dragons that are different colours, red, blue, green, black, and so on. And each dragon has different powers and different abilities and different nature, but people hunt them. Now within his, his world there is a sort of an early industrial revolution, so there's sort of steam ships and there's some technology, but people rely on the dragons for other things. If you ingest a small amount of their blood, then it has a different impact. Now only certain people can do this and survive and actually gives the desired results. For example, if you drink uh, red, then it gives you extra strength. 
and there's a little rhyme that goes with the different ones. So it says, blue for the mind, green for the body, red for fire, and black for the push. So drinking a small amount of um, blood from a blue dragon means people have a, a sort of form of telepathy, but not quite. They can communicate with someone else over long distances in a dreamlike trance. If you have red, uh, it gives you fire, it makes you sort of stronger and tougher and this sort of thing. So you think about if there's a small, a small number of people that can do this, the Bloodborne, it's not everybody, it's, a, it's quite a limited number. Then think about the people that have to hunt them and go after the dragons, because of course they're still very fierce creatures, they're still very powerful, a lot of people die going after them, so they have to be skilled. Then you think about if they hunt them too often or too many or to extinction, what does that mean? If they've built society and a number of industries and other things built upon as a foundation of these dragons, what happens when they're all gone? So within the book they have breeding pens to try and create them and husband them like you would with cows or sheep or something else, but it never completely works properly. For whatever reason, whenever they do them with wild dragons compared to ones that they're trying to raise themselves, the effects of the blood when they ingest it is not nearly enough. So that's something else he's built into his society. He's thought about well, what happens when you do that? What happens if you go too far? So they have to go further and further out to hunt for these dragons to get them because people want the blood and they'll pay an enormous amount of money for it. But of course, it doesn't have to be an animal. It could be a very rare plant, something that only grows in certain areas or at certain altitudes or in a certain place that gives people a very special and unusual ability. What that is, what it does, how it grows, where it comes from, is completely up to you to come up with something we've never seen before, surprise people. People love magic systems, people love finding new things, people love reading the back of a book and saying, oh, that sounds different and interesting, and that's always what they're searching for with fantasy, whether it's an agent or a publisher or a reader. They all want something cool that feels well thought out. So when you're building your fantasy world, you're building the monsters, the nature, the terrain, all these things are linked together, and spend a bit of time kind of laying it out and looking for the loopholes and working out, well, what can you do with it that we haven't seen before? So as I said at the start, terrain and nature are intrinsically linked. The two work very much together. Spend some time doing this on the world building, as I always say as well. Don't spend too long. Don't mistake world building for writing. You should spend some time on it, but not too much time. Not If you spend like nine months world building and you haven't done any writing within that period as well, I think that's far too long. So my idea is, you know, maybe six months maximum for world building before you start writing. Anything more, I think, is just you're having too much fun world building. It's great, it's addictive, but it's not writing. So your fantasy world needs to be well thought through. Readers want to spend some time within this other place that they've never seen before for it to be feel a little bit familiar, but also very alien and something completely unique. So spending a bit of time on all these different aspects of fantasy world building will pay dividends in the end. So that's it for today, but I'll be back very soon with another fantasy world building video.